Hi, thank you all for coming out. Um, so yeah, last year I edited a collection of books called Goodbye to All That, Writers on Loving and Leaving New York. And um, somehow that was a hit and um, that worked out well. And um, I just felt like I had more to say. Um, and also, a few people thought I was dissing New York, which I really was not doing. If you read that book, you would know that mostly, except for Rebecca Wolf's piece, it was um, <laughs> love letters to New York City. Um, and I also had wanted to include men, and um, so I contacted Rehane back there, and I said, I got more to say, let's do this. And, um, and so now we have um, this book, uh, Never Can Say Goodbye, writers on their unshakable love for New York. And um, unshakable love because uh, New York will try to shake it. Um, <laughs> New York is a, is a hard place to live and you probably don't need me to tell you that. But it's also a really incredible place. Um, it's a place full of contradictions and um, I lost my apartment nine years ago and, and can't afford to live here. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sad about that, but I also, um, I now live in Kingston, New York, which is a pretty great place. But um, there will never be any place for me like New York City, and I think that a lot of people feel that way. I think a lot of people have conflicted relationships with New York City, but um, a lot of people really hold it in their hearts as the most special place. Um, so tonight we have, um, f we have five readers, including me. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read a little bit of my essay for you, and then I'm going to introduce the other readers one at a time. Um, I'm going to read from the middle of my essay, and everybody will be reading portions of their essay. You'll have to buy the book if you want to know how they end or start. Um, I'm going to be reading from the middle of my essay. I used to live around here. I lived on 13th Street between 1st and 2nd. Um, I wrote a lot about that in my first piece. Um, the East Village had a really big influence on me. Um, I feel like a lot of people say that they became who they are in New York City. And um, I know that at least for me, on the way to becoming authentically me, I had to go through this uh, phase of trying to be cool because New York City is the coolest place in the world. And I think a lot of nerdy people come here to try and be cool. I was, you know, not original in that way. And um, so the beginning of my, my essay is called New York Cool. And um, I'm going to read from the middle of it. Um, More than New York City in general, the East Village is where I became me, although it took some time. I got a railroad apartment here in the East 90s, and like so many who moved there, I saw it as an opportunity to reinvent myself. Goodbye, parent-fearing, goody-two-shoes, self-conscious loner theater geek from Long Island. I was on my way to becoming, well, I still didn't know exactly who, but some kind of cool New Yorker. I looked to the East Village as my own dork rehab rehabilitation program designed to obliterate the scars of having grown up one of the teacher's kids in a rough blue-collar blue town on Long Island, home of Henry Hill of Goodfellas fame, filled with tough kids, some of them from families on the lowest rungs of the mafia totem, totem pole. <laughs> I'd often overhear the popular kids at school self-consciously gauging their coolness relative to one another. You go to the city? <laughs> yeah. Where you go? <laughs> CBGB's, Max's Kansas City, the Mud Club, even the folky bars on Bleecker Street were answers that would put you in pretty cool good standing. As opposed to confirmation class in synagogue. <laughs> or a sing-in at Merkin Concert Hall, where operatic vocalists fill the seats and sing along to Handel's Messiah with your dad in the baritone section. Bonus dork points, if you're, in the sing at, if you're at the sing-in instead of hanging out uptown with your friends who are having the once-in-a-lifetime experience of attending the, vi the vigil for John Lennon in Central Park. But now I lived in the city, so there. Not that it made me feel any more sure of myself, not right away, anyway. 
Once again, I found myself studying people for clues as to how to be. This time, the outspoken, often pierced and tattooed, and manic panic dyed women, writers, artists, poets, and singers I came across at places like the New York and Poets Cafe, Sidewalk, a grungy coffee house on, seven, on Avenue A called Limbo, and Deanna's, a jazz club on East 7th Street, where, the po where there were poetry readings on Sundays. That's the first place I heard the famous, po the, bleh, the famous slam poet Maggie Estep, who died tragically in 2014 from a sudden heart attack. And by the way, the collection is dedicated to Maggie Estep, who has an essay in Goodbye to All That. That was not the first time I'd caught sight of Maggie Estep. I can't recall the specific moment when I first encountered her somewhere in the East Village. I'm not sure whether it was before or after I'd caught her hilarious spoken word MTV video for Hey Baby off her No Mr. Nice Girl record. The one where she takes a lewd, crotch-grabbing cat collar completely off guard with a brilliantly absurd response, basically saying, sure, that sounds good to me, let's go back to my place. <laughs> For some reason I have it in my mind that I hadn't yet known the first time I spotted Maggie that she was famous, that you didn't need to know that in order to get what a cool New Yorker she was. To be impressed by the confident way she stomped around the city in a fitted black dress, fishnets, and combat boots, her full lips coated in that matte cinnabar red that was popular then, her expression equal parts, look at me, and who the fuck are you looking at? <laughs> I was in my mid-twenties then, just a couple of years younger than Maggie. I'm embarrassed to admit that before seeing the video for Hey Baby on MTV, it hadn't occurred to me to feel anything but flattered and validated when men on the street catcalled. Before hearing her perform the poem, The Stupid Jerk I'm Obsessed With, it hadn't quite dawned on me yet that I had one or more of those. I didn't know Maggie yet, but I looked up to her. Knowing that she lived in the East Village like I did make, made me feel like a cool New Yorker by association. She seemed genuinely to not give a shit what you thought of her, and that, more than anything, made her cool. Not just tough cool, not aloof for the sake of being cool, but self-possessed cool, New York cool. I found it impossible to master that. For the longest time, I still gave a shit, a sizable shit, about what people thought of me. <laughs> Kept aggressively trying to up my coolness quotient. For a while, I felt as if it was working. When I went to see one of the stupid jerks I was obsessed with play with his band at downtown nightclubs, I met editors from Billboard and Rolling Stone and started writing about music and nightlife for them and the New York Times and soon MTV News. But first and foremost, I was a musical theater geek, a lover of standards and show tunes. I was now familiar with a lot more music than I'd been as a kid, and I could enjoy and appreciate much, much of it. But I felt like a complete fraud, acting as any kind of arbiter in the rock and rap worlds. I had to do a nexus search every time I was assigned another music, musician or band to write about just to find out who they were. This was me trying to be cool, which of course was the opposite of cool. I had to quit that work. It was not me. I'd go into ghostwriting instead, which, well, obviously that wasn't me either, but in a different way. All right. Um, thank you. <laughs> For whatever reason, I decided tonight to go in alphabetical order by first name. I always pick another way. Um, so tonight, our first reader will be Amy Sohn. Um, and by the way, I'm so blessed to have all of these authors in this collection and the other collection. I, I'm amazed that so many people were so willing to um, jump in and... Um, so I, I'm, I'm really happy to have you all here and in the book. Um, Amy Sohn is the author of The Actress, Prospect Park West, and three other novels. She has been a columnist at New York Magazine, The New York Post, Grazia, and The New York Press. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and her daughter, Amy Sohn. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so nice to be reading with three amazing, four amazing writers who I've read with before. It's like a little reunion, right? 
I'll get to see, we only ever see each other when we're, <laughs> when we're, when we're out reading. Um, my, I was, as I was sitting next to Philip, I was realizing that we're both native New Yorkers and our, our, both of our stories deal with being uh, native New Yorkers. Mine is called The Studied Knowledgeability of the Native New Yorker. I'm just gonna read the, uh, uh, the first portion of it. In the summer of 1995, after graduating from Brown University, I reinstalled myself in my childhood bedroom in Brooklyn Heights to save money and try to get a job. Surrounded by my old Billy Joel albums, high school textbooks, and the yellow carpet stain from a mustache bleaching accident at 14, <laughs> I felt like I was a teenager all over again. And yet there was no shame in this. I was not a loser, but a pragmatist. For the native New Yorker, the decision to live in the city as an adult springs not from reckless bravery, but thrift. This was a temporary plan designed to get me on my feet. I signed up with a temp agency, re-signed with my old acting agent, I had done a lot of professional theater as a child, and began going on auditions. I told everyone I was a temptress, a temp and an actress. <laughs> I had an active, fun social life. One thing native New Yorkers need not worry about is making new friends. I went to bars, films, and dinners with high school and camp pals, most of them also living with their parents. That fall, I got a call from Noah, a friend I had met through the very small and insular world of progressive college-aged Jews. A native of Massachusetts, Noah was in grad school in the city. My sister Catherine just moved to Hell's Kitchen, he said, and she's looking to meet new people. Why don't we all go to dinner? We met in the village and I liked Catherine immediately. She had long, dark hair and blue eyes and she was bright, sarcastic, and a little shy. She laughed easily and though she smoked camel lights and wore motorcycle boots, there was something vulnerable about her. She was sharing an apartment with two roommates and caring for a handicapped man while interning for no pay at a literary magazine. A few days later, she called me and we began getting together a couple of times a week for coffee, dinner, or drinks. We often went to the Big Cup, a gay-friendly cafe in Chelsea. I should add, in the original version, I wrote a gay cafe in Chelsea and the, it must have been the legal department of, <laughs> of um, Simon & Schuster <laughs> changed it to gay-friendly. But I will just say, the Big Cup, if anyone has ever been there, it, is a gay, it was a gay cafe. It was, it was all gay men and and everyone who worked there was a gay man. So I think we would have been legally safe, but, <laughs> but you know, this is being, uh, anyway. Okay, so we often, <laughs> we often went to the Big Cup, a gay cafe in Chelsea, where we would talk explicitly about our sexual histories while surrounded by gay men who had no interest in eavesdropping. <laughs> After I booked a play in Tribeca, we would hang out at the Knitting Factory on Leonard Street, or the old Knitting Factory on East Houston, now Botanica. I took her to Sophie, in the East Village where I had drunk illegally in high school. I took her to Max Fish, Luna Lounge, Mercury Lounge, and the Brooklyn Inn in Borum Hill where Paul Oster had recently shot a movie starring Harvey Keitel. Feeling that Noah wanted me to take good care of Catherine, I shared with her all my New York insider tips. First Avenue and Allen Street are the same thing. <laughs> You have to know which part of the train to get on in if you want to avoid a long walk at your destination. And if you need to orient yourself, just look for the Twin Towers south. Though we were both dating actively, that took up only so many hours per week. The rest we spent with each other. She soon found a rent-controlled apartment in the East Village and became a regular at bars like the International and Big Bar, which wasn't big. <laughs> At that time in New York City, if you were young and single, the thought of staying home at night was anathema. The only thing at home was Ally McBeal. <laughs> Out meant bars, live music, alternative comedy, literary readings, and sex. There was a Molson Ice commercial featuring grungy looking 20-somethings, and in the voiceover, John Lurie growled, maybe I'll go to a city that never sleeps and maybe I'll put it to bed. What are you gonna do? <laughs> I actually found it on YouTube. You can go home. I, I don't know, I think you have to type Molson Ice and then you'll see like 15 commercials that aren't it before that one comes up. <laughs> 
we were all taking that question very much to heart. Catherine and I would sit at one of our haunts, she drinking Jameson, me whiskey sours, and talk about boys. We covered first loves, loss of virginity, most painful breakups. She was less promiscuous and more orgasmic. <laughs> She was better at smoking, I was better at pool. I welcomed her to my parents' apartment one night for dinner where she endured my father's quizzing about her life goals. Once she came for the weekend to their house in the Berkshires, we went downhill skiing and I envied her sleek style. At night, she smoked on the downstairs porch while I worried they would smell it. And we slept side by side on a fold-out couch whispering confidences. A few times I introduced her to guys I had dated, and she would sleep with them. <laughs> Sometimes she would date them for a few months, longer than I had been able to. I never told her I was jealous. I was a native New Yorker, and native New Yorkers are generous with ex-lovers. <laughs> and they understand that no one owns anyone. Once we were at Veselka with an art gallery assistant, a cute male friend of hers. He looked from her to me and said, you two approach men completely differently. Catherine attracts men like this. He slumped in his seat, lowered his eyelids and chin, and made bedroom eyes. And Amy approaches them like this. <laughs> he opened his eyes and mouth like in yoga class when you growl like a lion. It was true, she was quiet, contained, seductive. I met boys and did magic tricks. <laughs> My fear was that her method was more successful than mine, that guys liked her more because she knew how to be a little bit mean. I was never mean to guys because I wanted them all to love me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, our next reader, I have loved since her first memoir. Please excuse my daughter. Really hilarious. She's a really funny writer. Julie Clam um, is the author of Please Excuse My Daughter, You Had Me at Woof, Love at First Bark, and Friend Keeping, all Riverhead books. She writes for various publications, including the New York Times Book Review and Dame Magazine. She has a column um, called Dear Julie. Yeah. Is that correct? You can ask all your questions about friendship. Maybe you should, you know, email her. <laughs> um, and um, she lives in Manhattan, duh. Here she is, Julie Clam. <laughs> Um, I am jumping into the midst of the piece that I wrote for this book. So in order to find, to get the fascinating story of how I got to this place, you will have to buy the book. <laughs> for now. Um, uh, whatever your personal opinion of Woody Allen is, and I know you've got one, he was instrumental in my falling in love with this town. I had a book of his screenplays that I got at Caldor's. The cover showed the iconic still photo from Manhattan with Woody and Diane Keaton sitting in the fading light before the 59th Street Bridge. Rich, crisp, black and white, of course, the way it was meant to be. And it wasn't just the aching beauty, it was the life of Manhattan. Everyone was in therapy and ate out in restaurants and had apartments filled with fabulous art and overstuffed bookshelves and black soap. And through it all, Gershwin played. The conversation was filled with witty bon mots and intellectual discourse, and it was very cool to be Jewy. <laughs> My sense was that if I lived in Manhattan, I would belong there. I wouldn't feel out of place or lonely or unathletic or scared. A close friend of my parents, who was a beauty editor in the city, told me she would never exercise because what if she broke a nail? Those were my people. <laughs> However I was, it would be okay and hip. Manhattan wasn't for cheerleaders. When I first moved to New York City, I was appropriately at NYU Film School. And though we weren't watching Woody Allen, we were living it. I walked around with my Walkman listening to his soundtracks. It was then that I graduated to the grittier Martin Scorsese, New York City movies, Taxi Driver, and Mean Streets. I actually went to NYU with Martin Scorsese's daughter, who grew up in New Jersey. <laughs> and Lumet's Dog Day Afternoon. 
I could walk around Manhattan then and still see the stores and buildings and made up the, that made up the sets for the New York City films. It was the land of oddballs, misfits, beautiful misunderstood women, and guys that would punch people for them. I spent my after school hours in A Street Playhouse and the Thalia, revival movie houses that smelled like roach spray, and watched the glamorous New York of the 1930s with the butlers and ladies in satin and feather gowns who swept into their sparkling apartments and fixed themselves a highball. Though I always kind of figured I would, uh, anyway. You know the difference between, <laughs> you know the difference between New York and LA. That's what every stand-up comic asked during the 1980s, and they had all their own not necessarily funny take on it. Woody, of course, says Los Angeles' only cultural advantage was right on red. But to me, the difference was New York was all together and Los Angeles was spread out. There are other differences, too. Like, whenever I go to LA, I am sure that I am the fattest, palest, and oldest person there. By the way, the irony that there are only two US cities worthy of comparison is not lost on me. I went out there for a meeting in the early 90s and was staying at the Chateau Marmont. My appointment was a street away and I asked a woman at the front desk for directions. She told me this long roundabout way to go. Take a left up this hill over to Sunset. And I said, isn't it like a half a block away? And she said, yeah, but what about blah is on a one way street. And I said, but I'm walking. <laughs> Someone shrieked, and a, do a dog fainted. I did walk, too. I was like Ratso Rizzo to them. <laughs> the thing about the New York and movies and uh, TV shows is they never tell you that, though it's easy to get here, it's hard to stay. It's like being in love with this amazing person who's funny and breathtaking and constantly surprising, who shows up late at night at your door with amazing trinkets and and from flea markets, things that seem to have fallen from the moon, and the most wonderful food you've ever eaten. But they're wearing a big coat, and they keep your money in their pockets, and the pockets have big gaping holes in them where the money just falls out. I've been here for 30 years now. I've been married here, had a baby, seven dogs, been mired in the public school, Michigas, got divorced, and struggled a lot. I've been broke, and then I've been at the place where I looked back at it and thought, oh, I thought that was broke. Now, <laughs> this is broke. <laughs> but New York is my home, and New Yorkers are my home. Even, or maybe especially, the crazy ones. I never feel out of place here, except when I meet someone who's talking about moving out. There are two kinds of New Yorkers, the ones who could never leave, and the other ones. And I know it's probably true that life would be easier somewhere else, that New York Hollywood movies don't tell you how hard it is. It's like to say I don't mind the hard, I'd like to say that I don't mind the hard, but I hate it. God, I wish it was easier. I wish I lived in Woody Allen's apartment, though I hear these days people scream at him whenever he goes outside. It doesn't really matter because I simply couldn't survive somewhere else. I've been here this long, I'm not giving up now. Toward the end of Manhattan, there's that scene of Woody Allen laying on the couch, talking into a tape recorder about what makes life worth living. It's Woody's list. Groucho Marx, Willie Mays, the second movement of the Jupiter Symphony, Louis Armstrong's recording of Potato Head Blues, Swedish movies, Sentimental Education by Flaubert, Martin Marlon Brando, the crabs at Sam Woe's, et cetera, et cetera. I can honestly say that not a single one of those items is on my list. In fact, my list is very short. My kid, my dogs, and this beautiful, fucked up, heartbreaking mother of a city. Thank you, Julie. Um, Julie says there are two kinds of New Yorkers. E.B. White says there are three. Um, and by the way, this book, uh, the first book was inspired by Joan Didion's essay, Goodbye to All That. And this book was inspired by E.B. White's essay, Here is New York. Um, and E.B. White says there are three kinds of New Yorkers, the ones who are born here, the commuters, and the ones who come here seeking it from somewhere else. And um, our next reader writes about that um, very specifically. Um, he also takes a swipe.
white, but goodbye to all that in his essay. <laughs> and yesterday on his brother's show on WNYC, he told me that my contention that New York City was losing its soul because it's getting too expensive too fast was complete bunk. <laughs> but he can get away with it because he is the absolute undisputed god of the personal essay, and I'm very, very fortunate to have him in this book, Philip Lopate. <laughs> Thank you, Sari. Um, I'm going to read from uh, my essay, To Live and Die in New York, and I'm going to jump around starting at the beginning. <clears throat> I am a native New Yorker, which means I was ruined in the crib for life elsewhere. <laughs> the milk I drank from my mother's breast probably contained window soot, <laughs> or was diluted with traces of Rheingold beer and egg creams. <laughs> We're all familiar with E.B. White's division of New Yorkers into three categories. The ones who were born here and, like myself, supposedly, quote, takes the city for granted and accepts its size and its turbulence as natural and inevitable. The one who commutes into work each day. And the third, as E.B. White says, who was born elsewhere and came to New York in quest of something, end quote. It is from this last group of provincial questers that most of the disillusioned literary pieces about leaving New York are drawn. I find such essays from F. Scott Fitzgerald to John Cheever to Joan Didion, not to mention a recent anthology about quitting New York, <laughs> however graceful stylistically, finally tedious and beside the point. <laughs> They came here for party and overstayed, poor dears. <laughs> they viewed it in their 20s as a mecca for the young and then got older, tis tisk. <laughs> as a native New Yorker, which is to say an old soul who never believed in the glamour of youth, who has tried to live in other climes and come around to electing this city as my catafalque and final resting place, I have no choice but to embrace it with ardor. Disillusionment is not an option. There is a certain muscular set in the New Yorker's face that reveals the owner's tension, exasperation, wariness, elation, and expectation, and easily legible layers. <laughs> or so I find it. When I lived in Houston or San Francisco and took public transportation there, I looked at the other bus riders and could not begin to imagine what they were thinking. But I have the sense, which could be completely misguided, that I can read the faces of New Yorkers, can easily slip into their streams of consciousness. This conviction, so important for a fiction writer, has nothing to do with any special attribute of New Yorkers. It simply means that I am a local here and would probably feel the same ease of identification with the populace's inner lives if I had been a native all my life of Cairo, Illinois, say. On the other hand, maybe it is, it does have something to do with the specific character of New York because the greatest asset of the city is its plentiful public space. In its streets, parks, subways, even its semi-public spaces like schools, hospitals, libraries, restaurants, you feel you have the right to be there and to enjoy the company of strangers about whom you are free to speculate. <laughs> you are equally free to wallow in loneliness, self-pity and alienation. Though I myself never feel completely lonely or self-pitying if a swarm of people surrounds me. Like Whitman, I am energized by the crowd and momentarily a believer in democracy. <laughs> My favorite place to be in New York is the subway. I love to sit down, if I can find a seat, and look around and see the human hand that has been dealt me. A mother and her squirming little boy to my right, a fat man sleeping across the aisle. Have you noticed how often people sleep in the subway? Even standing up, they close their eyes, summoning dreams or just gray oblivion. Of course, you could say that they close their eyes to ward off having to take in the strangers around them, which is a misanthropic interpretation. I prefer to think they feel so comfortable in the subway that they let themselves go, maybe even more so than they might in the privacy of their homes. Some contemporary poet should update Whitman's The Sleepers and write a great ode to the subway passengers rocking in the rickety arms of Morpheus and the MTA. 
and then they are the subway readers of difficult books. I like to imagine that New Yorkers are more literate than the writers of other American metropolises. When I was a college student taking the subway all the way from Brooklyn to Columbia, I used to read fat Russian novels such as The Idiot or Anna Karenina with the covers conspicuously exposed. <laughs> always hoping against hope that some pretty unattached woman nearby would be impressed. <laughs> if she were the one reading a great classic, I would fantasize engaging her in a long conversation about what she thought of the book, whether she liked it or not, and then we would make love, get married, and have babies. <laughs> I still take tomes back and forth, most recently rereading The Magic Mountain on the subway, and try to peek at the titles of my fellow readers, although now it doesn't matter whether the person beside me is a man or a woman, I simply want to know what educated young people are reading. If an attractive girl is deep into a paperback by a hip, trendy writer such as Amy Zahn or <laughs> Nick Flynn, I'm immediately disheartened. What's the use, I think? I have never spotted anyone on the subway reading one of my books. <laughs> Though others have reported such sightings to me. But just today I saw a nice looking young woman take out of her purse Primo Levi's Survival in Auschwitz and start to read with concentration, wrinkling her nose at what must have been a horrific passage. You can't get much better than Primo Levi. Come to think of it, once I saw a couple take out matching paperbacks of Plato's Republic, which they were probably assigned for class, and start to imbibe the noble Athenian's philosophy. It was almost enough to balance out all the young people playing dumb games on their cell phones. <laughs> what I like especially is when the subway rises above ground for a few stops, the way it does on the F train at Smith and 9th Street and 4th Avenue, and I can see the whole city spread out around me. The light is so beautiful suddenly, I remember reading a comment from Norman Mailer decades ago when he wrote for the Village Voice that the New York subways were a disgrace, like the black hole of Calcutta. First of all, I don't think Norman had ever been to Calcutta. <laughs> so why was he defaming the place? And second of all, I just don't get it, this denigration of a magnificent mass transit. The subways, to my eyes, are a godsend, efficient, they get me where I want to go pretty quickly, they provide entertainment, sometimes via musicians who perform at sta station platforms, sometimes through the singing panhandlers who traipse through the cars, and most important, they are a stay against solipsism, proof positive that I am not alone in the universe. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, in his essay, he doesn't say Amy Stone and Nick Flynn. He, he has a little, uh, you know, uh, a code, first initial, and he told me yesterday who they are, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, our next reader and I um, just met in person for the first time tonight, but we almost met last year um, in Hudson, New York, at a memorial for Maggie Estep. Um, Poor Shista Kakapur and I both knew Maggie, but we did not meet each other. Um, but we got to know each other a little bit through email. Um, it was a terrible, it was terrible, terrible weather, and so I didn't feel safe driving, and so I didn't get to go to the memorial. Um, but in any case, I'm and I'm a big admirer of um, Poor Shista's work, so um, I'm going to tell you about her. Poor Shista Kakapur is the author of the novels The Last Illusion and Sons and Other Flammable Objects, the latter of which came out, uh, which was a 2007 California Book Award winner in first fiction, one of the Chicago Tribune's Fall Best and a coming in, and a, no, sorry, and a New York Times editor's choice. Her writing has appeared in fourth, or is forthcoming in Harper's, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, Slate, Salon, The Daily Beast, Spin, L, NPR, and many other uh, publications around the world. She is currently writer in residence at Bard College and visiting writer at Wesleyan University. Born in Tehran and raised in Los Angeles, and she taught me the word Tarangalis. <laughs> um, she lives in New York City and Tivoli? Okay, all right. <laughs> Poor Shista Kakapur. <laughs>
I'm actually still commuting um, from New York City, and Bard is not happy with that because they want their writer in residence to actually be in residence. But I guess it's appropriate for this reading that I just can't <laughs> quit the city. I mean, I really love living in Harlem. I've been there for two years now, and I can't stop with that neighborhood. Um, I'm going to read somewhere in the middle. This is huge pressure to end this reading, but I'm going to end some. Started in somewhere in the middle. Um, my essay is called "Conversions: Coming of Identity in Late '90s New York." and it just basically um, goes through various scenes of me in um, the late 90s when I or the mid 90s I got to New York City to go to Sarah Lawrence College and then all the way to 9-11 which I write about quite a bit so this is a section that has a lot to do with Sarah Lawrence and if you don't know where Sarah Lawrence is um, well, I kind of tell you, but it's it's Bronxville. It's just just outside the city, just barely. It's about a 25-minute ride to Grand Central. So, um, and if you don't, do you guys? Yeah, I mean, whatever. You'll know. It's just like a very weird, and uh, I no longer feel extremely positively about it. I hope there's no one from Sarah Lawrence here. Okay, um, but anyways, you'll see. Um, okay. Sarah Lawrence College, Bronxville, New York, a 25-minute Metro North ride from the city, that home I decided was, long, was home long before I ever set foot in it. But the college felt worlds away. Having come from suburban greater Los Angeles, suburban greater NYC felt like a bit of an insult to me. For example, one thing I did not expect was that there would be more white people than in my hometown. Here I was the only Iranian, not just in my greater school, but on the whole college campus of 1200. There were again only a couple other Middle Easterners, New York's Iranian American population being mostly limited to the Jewish Great Neck enclave of a mere and yet relatively impressive 2000. That's 20% of Great Neck's population. I think it's higher now, actually. And here they were royalty, at least, or, or at least they act like, acted like it. it. <laughs> But then again, everybody was somebody there. Even my most normal seeming hallmate was Peter Gabriel's daughter. While my name didn't quite stand out among the Eurydices and Harmonies and Africas, at Sarah Lawrence, I actually passed less than ever at first. But not because of my complexion or my hair, but because of my clothes. On the first day, I wore jean cutoffs and pumas and wife beater with no makeup and a ponytail, my suburban Angelino trap trash standbys, I suppose. A lesson I learned never to repeat as I became a regular East Village shopper, blowing sometimes the whole of my parents' hundred or so sent to me every other month, just a little something to supplement my scholarship money and the student affairs office job I worked part-time on something ostentatious and mostly useless, like a pair of clownish platform shoes that were the norm on Bates Hill or the SLC runway, among the ample foliage and Tudor cottages of the campus center. My hallmates wore Prada and Gucci and gave me their high school hand-me-downs, and more than once after a few drinks, Amaretto, Chartreuse, Midori, they reminded me in the ride, double-bind delivery of true socialites that their parents were perhaps paying for me to go there. They were curious about where I was from, charmed almost to know me, but often, just as I'd get started with my story, they'd cut right in and move right on. Meanwhile, the m more academia stuffed me with Derrida and Chomsky, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, Foucault and Sartre, the more difficult I found it to talk to my own family. They'd rotate the phone and I'd numbly go through the motions, praying I wouldn't explode. What are you learning? My mother asked. My mother was an accountant. I can't get into it. Really complicated stuff. I like it. Are you getting good grades? We don't have grades, Mom, I reminded her with a groan. She paused. Have you done, how have you done your tests? We don't have tests here, Mom. I snapped, starting to get nasty. I would go through this weekly, it seemed. I'll put your dad on. <laughs> He'd get on and start grilling me about the weather for a while and then also get to irritating stuff. So, so what's your major and minor? We don't have those, Dad. Do you mean my concentration? What? Writing, I'd say, giving up. Just don't worry about it. What math are you taking, he'd asked. I'm not. He, a math professor, would go silent. My brother, 13, would then get on. Have you gone to the Empire State, the Statue of Liberty? I live in Bronxville. The Bronx? No, never mind, I'd grumble. Mom says there's drugs there. Are there drugs? <laughs> no, I lied. I wouldn't know. 
Do you have friends, he asked. I could tell my mother had planted these questions in him. <laughs> yes, do you, nerd? What are they like? I didn't know who was my friend and who wasn't. Even with multiple makeovers, gothish, punk rock, light, nerdcore-esque, hip, hippie, I could never manage to sink into a scene. My s solution was to, with this unease was just like high school to get away. In all my undergraduate years, it was not the libraries that offered me a home, not the bookstores, not the readings, not dorms of friends and lovers, not office hours with idols, not cubicles of internships at the greatest publications on earth, not anything but New York City nightclubs. I spent all my time, sometimes spare, sometimes not, in clubs. Electronic music and its physical incarnation, the rave, felt a sort of great equalizer. In the subterranean universe of gut-stabbing beats, its conversationless sea of bobbing bodies and impossibly XXXXL attire, you can tell anyone apart, boy or girl, much less the misguided identifiers of otherness. I'd enter the arenas, clubs, and often just patches of woods, like a ghost in a dream, mine coated in the glitter of illegal psychoactive stimulants, and I'd exit straight to a deep, viscous sleep with no clear recollection of anything or anyone in that other world of mine. In a time of self, 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 I wonder if we kept it that way, anonymous, impersonal, cool, blank, on purpose. My uniform is hoodie, cargo pants, silver chain, colorful, limited edition Nikes, preferably from Japan. I could have been a boy from the warehouse next door. It was irrelevant, and yet it was, an, an, it was intentional. But why? Who was I? Why? I was, in a way, taking small steps towards self-definition, ones that had nothing to do with the body I was born in, the DNA of my parents, the blood of my ancestors. I was, for instance, a smoker, something I had taken up freshman year in New York City. I was a yoga student. I was an occasional drug dabbler, cocaine here and there, though there was, that was more a Sarah Lawrence sort of poison, and ecstasy primarily in the city because of the constant promise of pure MDMA from the West Coast via Europe or some other likely tall tale. I was left politically, I guessed. I was a lover of literature. Lesbian or bisexual, I constantly went back and forth about these, mainly because of my already established love of all things alternative, but I was in the end neither. <laughs> I was a writer, I ventured, but somehow every vision I had of that, desk, chair, pen, typewriter, books, window, dog at feet, implied that making a home was involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pora Shusto. Well, thank you, all of you. Thank you to all the wonderful readers. Um, Amy Sohn, Julie Clam, Philip Lopate, Pora Shusto Kakpur. Thank you to Emily Simpson and The Strand for having us. Um, we're going to be around to sign books, if you would like. And also, there's another person here tonight who has an essay in the book. My husband, Brian Macaluso. Uh, if you want to get his signature, I'm sure he'll give it to you. Um, and uh, thank you for coming. Did you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Just wanted to extend a thanks on behalf of Strand for you guys for coming tonight as well. And we do have uh, these lovely contributors' most recent titles available at the back of the room as well. So please make sure you stick around, get a copy of their books, and hang out and meet them. Thank you all for coming. Take care.